All right, Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have the return of Brenda Sauter of The Feelies and Wild Carnation. Brenda is the bass player in the band The Feelies and the singer-songwriter in the band Wild Carnation. Now, last time I talked with Brenda, we got into The Feelies and Wild Carnation's first album, Tricycle. In this conversation... We dive into Wild Carnation's second album, Superbus, which has now just been re-released. Also, during the day of this conversation, um, Wild Carnation released all the demos for Superbus on their Bandcamp. So if you go to Wild Carnation Bandcamp, you can check out all the demos that went into the record, which was a really cool add-on to the re-release of Tricycle. And it's, it's, it's quite incredible how much detail and thought these guys put into to their demos before they would hit it in the studio. Um, but we get into that in our conversation. Also during this conversation, we dive deeper into Brenda's time with Speed the Plow and what the Feelies have been up to. The Feelies just put out a new record called Some Kind of Love. It's a cover album of the Velvet Underground, a live record, their first live record. It's available now on all streaming platforms. So, this conversation, we dive into Superbus. And if you want to hear more of uh, Brenda and I talk about her history with the Feelies in, in more detail, check out our first episode. It came out about a year ago here on the podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on any of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests like Brenda and sharing their insights with you. With that being said, here's my conversation with Brenda. In the jump into it, we kind of left off and we didn't really talk too much about it, so I wanted to start off with it with a speed the plow. Oh yeah. So we talked about being a tripe and working with the uh, uh, the bomb gardeners and um, starting there, and we mm-hmm. we got up to wild carnation. But right before you were doing, you were playing with uh, speed the plow, right? Right. Um, gosh, you know, I don't remember what year I joined speed the plow but it it would have been early very early 90s possibly 1990 um that's something i or you could probably one of us could research um because it would be part of uh like if you were to um look at the um disc list uh for speed the plow you'll see what year the different recordings came out and who's on it. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, it, w- it was early 90s because I, I recall um, 1992, um, Speed the Plow played a series at Maxwell's in Hoboken called Folk and Fondue. And it was basically the, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of um, Maxwell's, but there was the back room and that's where the, you know, the rock shows were, but in the front was this, um, really nice bar and restaurant. And so in the front room, there was a series, um, might've been weekly, might've been monthly. I don't really recall where the bands would play acoustically. So kind of it, it was an unplugged type, um, situation. And, um, so at that point it was, uh, um, John and Tony Baumgartner, uh, Mark Francia, uh, now Chris O'Donovan from Wild Carnation, or yeah, Wild Carnation was was just starting at that point. Um, so Chris uh, Chris was the drummer in Speed the Plow. Um, Stan Demeski had been the drummer. He was going off with Luna. And um, Chris and Stan were actually friends. They grew up together. And Stan had given Chris drum lessons when they were younger. Um, so Chris had a connection to the Heldon bands already. Um, it was just this nice coincidence that, you know, he knew Stan and then I met Rich and Chris. And, you know, many things in life go in a circle. Um, the people that you meet, you would probably meet anyway, because you're just following the same path and you just meet them in a, in one way or another. Um, so I, I don't recall how many albums of Speed the Plow um, I was on or Wild Carnation, but I, I think I was on three. And then um, Rich and Chris and I were on 
one or two, maybe. The the last album that we put out was Marina. And um, uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the tribe stopped playing and out of that rose Speed the Plow. And that would have been the late 80s, I believe, the very, uh, like, 88-ish. Um, I could be off by a year or so, but it was, let's just say the late 80s. Um, so so the non feelies members of the tribes went on to form Speed the Plow, and then others joined the group. They got a bass player, they got um, a drummer, and the drummer was uh, Jim DeRogatis, who's a actually a, a rock um, or music writer. Um, so they put out one album and then um, I believe I would have been on the next album with Stan. So the, the band reformed, um, actually they they reform fairly often or you know from time to time they'll members will um, come in, other members will go out. Um, so it it um, it's always a, a a changing group with a few people at the still at the core. Um, I know I'm, I'm getting off on on tangent. No, Sorry. That's, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, it's a definite. It's a it's a fascinating group because of that. Like John and Tony are always there, but like it's a rotating cast that always makes. Yeah. And like listen, what's I guess from. And that that was kind of a theme with those two, even in the tripes, I feel. But like, uh, what was I guess as far as like kind of playing with them in the beginning in the tripes compared to Speed the Plow? Did you notice like a mus uh, like a a different type of musical like a musical language that was being spoken together? Then was it like ran differently or what? Like, like I guess uh, from before and after, what was kind of some of the creative differences? as a member of Speed the Plow compared to the Tripes? Yeah, uh, the Tripes were a bit more um, droning. Um, it had a, most of the songs had a sort of meditative feel, um, kind of getting back to bare bones and, and building music um, with like not a lot of chords, not too many words. Um, you could really almost meditate to the music again not not all of it but it was generally more uh, um bare bones rhythmic type of feel vocals were um a little more buried and deliberately so um but the the original tribes um had a singer um el bruce and um so his his vocal would have been a little more prominent, um, but the tripes like once um, Stan and Bill and I joined, um, the the lead singer aspect was was not there. It was more various people singing. Um, so Speed the Plow, I would say, became much more melodic. Um, more words, more stories, whereas the, the tripes might have been more, the, the lyrics might have been more elusive. Speed the Plow, there are more stories that are told, you know, about about a play or an event, more, more life experiences. And um, I would say more, more layering, a little more pop. Um, yeah, so... So lyrics, more melody, definitely more harmony, um, more layers on top, and um, some really driving songs, and then some songs that were more like waltzes, had a folky aspect, and then also more driving rock aspect. Um, and some of the songs in Speed the Plow um rose up out of songs that the tripes either left behind or forgot about or or reworked um for instance hard friend to keep is a song that came out of um, a tripe song called 
uh, um, friends. Uh, it's it's quite different, um, but but there were there were songs that were sort of left behind, and then resurrected. That's cool. It's cool to see like yeah, that it was growth. it was nice seeing, yeah seeing these songs either emerge new or an older song. And sometimes I guess I might have been the catalyst in that because I oh you know remember this song it went like such and such and and um i don't know i i hope i wasn't being annoying or pushy but it, if it was a song i really liked and and really didn't want to see it left behind um for the, those times that this you know it did happen um it was nice to see a tripe song not get left behind and be brought to the present in speed the plow cool do you remember any other tunes that you brought up that kind of saw the uh, light, came to light and became a new, another new tune, like Friend? Um, oh, I should have done my homework. Um, I wasn't expecting. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> the plow heavy. Um, um, and then it would start with just remembering a melody and saying, oh, remember this melody. Um, but there, there was one that, didn't become a speed of the plow song, but it was found on a um, on a bottom line performance of the by the stripes. And right at this moment, I can't think of how it goes, but it it was released as a um, tripes. There have been a few tripes compilations that came out um, in recent years, and so some of those tracks are on there. Um, but yeah, I can't I. I can't think on the spot of um, um, of an example. And I, if I could get a, a Speed the Plow album in front of me, then I could. Wait. Okay, I do have Mason's box in front of me. Um, I don't see any on here. Although Follow Your Visions, that's a song that I wrote. Yeah, and I wrote it during the years of the um, the feelies, and um, I had given a tape, a, a, a demo tape that I had made, um, gave it to John, and he asked, "Oh, can we could we do follow your vision?" So that um, that ended up on um, the Mason's Box album. Okay, so also so okay that was during feelies times, but also. During this time too, when you're playing with uh, Speed the Plow, uh, were you doing the duo with Patty as well? That was um, uh, let's see that that was um, ninety one through actually it was it was about a year because um, um, Patty and I played out here and there, and we met in nineteen ninety one because I was working in Hoboken. Um, and then Wild Carnation emerged in April of 92. So I think both groups were still going, um, Eva Luna and, um, Wild Carnation. And then eventually, um, I'm not sure how Eva Luna ended, whether it was me saying, you know, I really don't have the time or Patty saying, you know, let's let's move on. I I really don't remember the circumstances, but there was no big blow up or anything. It was just um, a very gentle parting of the ways. <clears throat> um, so they were uh, they coexisted, and then um, Patty and I stopped playing together, and while Carnation became, um, you know, um, more frequent, took up more was more active okay all right so so that that's because that's an interesting uh, like kind of a crossover between these groups playing with this group you kind of started with again and like seeing them kind of come together and get tighter and like really work ideas in a different way and like um also kind of like supporting someone else in making their visions come to light and then uh having a group that's doing your own um because I remember last time when we talked to you, you were saying you 
you you like to do harmonies more. That's where you found yourself uh, bringing other people's ideas more to life. And then like so now in 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 Wild Carnation when you guys are writing tunes like um, you're coming up with melodies to chord structures and you got this kind of like this uh, this Team Supreme effort going to like make it. <laughs> <I, laughs> we like to think of um, oh Carol King, um, Gotham and King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not not quite as prolific, but um, yeah, we we appreciate their um, their their songwriting together. Was it, well, yeah, I think these th- these two records are great. Like, but um, so like that kind of pro- did Wild Carnation start off like clearly? Oh, this is gonna be a band, or was it kind of just like writing tunes and like, oh, we got like a um, we got we got a set now. Like, was it was it like a natural formation that made it into a group or? Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that we all went into it like we are we are forming a band. And, you know, very, very early on, um, I, I, I don't know that any of us knew exactly what the dynamics were going to be or what it would sound like. Um, what we did know at the time was that Chris was playing drums, Rich was playing guitar, and I was playing bass. And I, I think it was more during rehearsals, like our first rehearsal where I... Um, where they had they had tunes like songs that rich had written either recently or years ago you know and then we're, we're talking 1992 um so these were songs that he would have written in the 80s and i i think i just said well hey i you know i like to write lyrics and melodies and and so it was just kind of i think it was just more on the spot like oh okay oh that works you know um, because I don't know what the group would have been like if um, if that didn't happen. Um, previously, when Michael Imperioli was in the group, that um, they never had a name. Um, what you know, what would eventually become Wild Carnation? Um, he brought in his voice and lyrics. So so maybe they were Chris and um, Rich were expecting whoever came in to sing and bring in lyrics and melody. But I just don't recall that being um, in the job description. <laughs> my, my memory is more like, oh, who, who's, who's going to sing? Oh, you don't sing? Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, who, who writes the lyrics? And so kind of finding out um, when we met that, there would be more um, collaboration and I would be the default singer. I mean, Chris, Chris sings, but um, I, I don't know. There, there just wasn't, I don't recall an option that he would become the lead singer. So it was kind of by default. <laughs> but those are always the situations that pan out to be like, well, you know, that really worked out like that, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so okay, so kind of, and it seems like it wasn't. It seems like an environment where it was like very welcoming and like not like, ah, oh, crap, I have to do this, but rather like I can do this. Was yeah, it like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't have. I mean, I was not as prolific as someone like John Baumgartner, um, but I did have songs that, or pieces of songs that I'd been writing since I was a teenager. Some of it not good at all um but some of it you know i was hoping to someday um turn it into a song um and like i shared last time i would i would have trouble coming up with chords i do much better when the chords are there already and i can hear a melody or harmonies on top of it um so so that was that worked out well to um to have this small backlog of things that I'd written and now I could try to fit them into Rich's songs. Um, So, you know, like I said, some of it worked out well, some did not fit in. Um, But what I was able to do was just take pieces of songs that I had written and, and just use 
just use that part for a wild carnation song. Um, like the rising tide off of Tricycle. Um, that was a melody that was floating around in my head since I was probably, I don't know, 12 years old. And so almost 20 years later, it finally had um, a, a place where it fit. And I kind of remember, uh, you know, if you if you were to listen to the rising tide with no lyrics or and a bit of the song is instrumental, so you could hear pretty easily what it would sound like just as an instrumental. And then I just had this melody that didn't fit anywhere else. And I thought, well, let me just try it here in different parts of the song. And it actually worked in this kind of weird sort of way. And so that little you know, snippet found, finally found a home after 20 years. Um, so yeah, so it could be full um, uh, full out um, hearing a, a, an instrumental that Rich had written and finding and just coming up with new lyrics, new melody, or it could be sort of retrofitting something that I had already into um, one of his um, his pieces. That feels so good, though, when you get that idea out there. Mm-hmm. And you're like, it has it home. I'm, I'm done with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it exists. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I and I have to say, getting back to Speed the Plow, um, that that was um, an atmosphere of bringing what you had to the table. So you know, John was clearly the the songwriter. Um, but then, uh, what I recall is just being able to say, "Hey, can I sing this one?" or he might say, do you want to sing this one? And I would say, yeah. Or um, just coming up with harmonies. You know, if he or Tony were going to be singing um, to just come up with with some harmonies. And um, so kind of like weaving a bass part in. Um, it was it was a similar thing in weaving um, some background harmonies. So So that was really a lot of fun. And it was it was very fulfilling for me because the things that I love to do, I was able to do there. That is that is a really cool, like kind of nurturing, like creative environment where it's like bring whatever you got. If it works, it works. And if not, bring something else next time, you know, like Mm -hmm. that. And they they kind of like that's kind of like their personalities, too. Like I I talked with them, I think maybe a year or two ago, and they seem very like Mm -hmm. uh like I don't know what that is, welcoming to that and like mm-hmm. I, I can't find a good word to describe it but like um that and that's cool that 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 kind of care it sounds like that carried into the into wild carnation um yeah like the bringing to the table and yeah. sharing yeah yeah but being a being yeah. kind of John in the situation <laughs> mm-hmm. or it was uh, well um it would be kind of John with two heads because you'd have Rich and me. Um, whereas John would would do um, would write lyrics and music and melody. Um, Rich and I divvied it up, um, except for well, more recent songs. Um, more of them have been totally Rich's creation, and um, especially ones that haven't been. Re- recorded yet so uh, you know uh, the theoretical third album by Wild Nation would have a bit more of dream songs like he wakes up and there's this whole um, a, a bit of the, the lyric um, the the melody it's all there whoa that's yeah. that's always been a like I've had a couple dreams like that where I can kind of remember a melody and like yeah, words but I wake I, w- I would wake up and write that write it or try to mm-hmm. write it and it just it's your the narrow chemicals that are releasing in your brain as soon as you wake up are slowly deteriorating that that memory so it's like yeah. I never could get it down quick enough so that's a pretty impressive it, feat yeah and they go it it disappears so quickly um, well back back in the day I don't know how old you are but you sound young. Uh-huh. Um, Okay, you're young. Yeah, you're young. <laughs> um, back in the day, you, you didn't have your phone. You didn't have a hand recorder. 
you had to remember it or try, yeah, like you said, try to write it down. And sometimes it's just a scribble of, I mean, who has the music notation um, paper right there? It's just write an E, okay, two E's if you're going to be holding it longer, a D, a C. Um, but now with phones, um, there's sometimes when I've woken up with a song and I just grab the phone and go somewhere where no one can hear me because it's in the middle of the night and then just sing into the phone. Um, just just a little bit of humming and maybe maybe say the chords. Um, but uh, but I guess Rich is able to he does that, too, but I think he's able to retain it long enough to then go pick up a guitar and play it. So his phone is just chock full of, I don't know how many files of, of song snippets that just come, you know, during the day. And, but actually um, more of his ideas come from just sitting down and playing a guitar without really, it's, it's sort of subconscious. You're just playing and then it evolves and then, and then you like what you hear and then make a recording. Um, not so much waking up with the whole song, but just having an idea as you're just, you know, subconsciously playing. Um, so at least he's awake when when this happens. And, you know, he's got a guitar in his hand and all he has to do is reach for the phone and then make a quick recording. That 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 is much more reachable of a goal, <laughs> from yeah. Because I, I, there's that space you get into when you you kind of just show up and you're being creative, like you you pl- give a little bit of a time a day and you 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 make that those seventeen minutes or whatever just to sit down and putz around and something usually will show up because you showed up. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's this kind of like a attendance, and the, in those ideas can kind of. Uh, you can catch them a little easier if you're always show mm-hmm. up to go fishing. I don't know metaphor. Yeah, that, that's a great way. That's a great way to put it. You're you're present, and I I think my problem is I am not present enough. So I will go, um, you know, vacuum the floor. I'll I'll find other things to do and avoid sitting down with an instrument in hand and just letting things flow. And, and I think I'm just afraid to let that happen because I just, I, I'm, and this could be total bull. This could just be something that's totally in my imagination. But I just kind of have the feeling that if I, if I dove into that, it would be a long time before I came up. Um, like it would just be too consuming and I wouldn't be able to get on with the other things in my life. I'm just afraid of of sitting down and seeing if a whole song, everything would just come out of letting go. I I I just I'm afraid to let go like that. It's it's I I relate to that. I re- I definitely do because like there's times I f- like to I I see some of my friends who play and they can just let go and they go crazy and they're throwing themselves everywhere. And like, and maybe maybe it's like singing and playing. You like, you can't really go too too crazy. You gotta like maintain a certain thing to do multiple things at once. But also, right. also just within the the letting go of caring if this is a good or bad idea. I'm just going to track this. Just that I haven't found that full uh, departure for myself as well as being like, here it is, whatever, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, and like. Maybe maybe it's also kind of like uh, when you when you play in different groups and you're kind of supporting other people's ideas and like you're uh, you're kind of a member of a team. There's this kind of like unsaid pressure that you put upon yourself that like I gotta make this good for Tom and Jerry and fill in the people that I'm playing with. You know what I mean? Like I can't mm-hmm. do I, I don't want to let them down, so I can't. You know what I mean? So that also kind of like, for me, that's sometimes where I, I relate to that pressure where like, I don't know if I can let go because I got to make sure I deliver for these guys here. <laughs> like, Yeah, yeah. Um, and also related to that, I, I thought you might say, now another, another aspect of that or approach to that is that 
when someone else writes a song and you just bring in your part, it can be easier. I, I thought you were going to say there's no pressure on you because it's the, it's the lead writer who has more pressure. So you can just bring something to the table and it's like, okay, all I had to do is this bass part. All right. You know, that's, that's okay. That's easy. Um, but, but the pressure, if you become, if you walk into that room and say, Hey, I have this song, complete song that just came out of nowhere, then you're in charge. It, it's like the decision of whether you want to be a worker bee or you want to be the CEO and each has its pluses and minuses but being a CEO there's a lot more pressure because you're the leader i'd say that's the flip side of what you were what you were saying and not to disagree that's just another it i guess it just depends on what you're feeling when you um you know walk into that room with the band Right, right. No, and uh, yeah, I, I think they're both different pressures, you know, that kind of get in the way of letting yourself go, like e yeah. either direction. Yeah. So I, I think they're the, I definitely they're they're both a valid and like uh, um, things that because when you started telling me that I I went through pitching songs to my band, <laughs> like there's mm -hmm. like these guys have been I've been playing with my band for years. And and I primarily bring the songs to the table, so this isn't anything new. But every time I do, I feel that, oh crap! Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, what I mean? like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I definitely relate to that pre to that pressure, but um, mm -hmm. but in in like so I can see like where where you'd be like I don't know if I can dive into that moment yet. You know what I mean? To to fully immerse yourself in that because those those afterthoughts of what to do with it later are kind of there at the beginning in a way too yeah like what well, you're yeah, right what am i going to do with this and um, but i i was at a gathering earlier today and coincidentally talking about um uh well um groups where or, or a friend who um has to let has to do poetry because it just has to come out so there are some people who it doesn't matter whether it's going to be published or not it just it has to flow out of them that I, I guess they would be um I, I don't know if they would go crazy or i i don't know the extent of what would happen if they didn't release but it's a strong enough feeling where they, they have to do their poetry. They have to write it down. Um, so, so that with songwriters, I guess to, to a point, are, are, the question is, are you the person who has to get it out? You have to just get it on your phone, write it down, whatever. Or are you the person who says, well, you know, yeah, it's okay, but I'll, I'll just let it go. You know, if I remember it tomorrow, fine. If not, it's it's okay to let it go. Um, I think people probably, some people have a stronger urge to share it, whether you're going to sell thousands of copies of a book or just share it with a friend. Um, you know, same thing with, with music. We can just, you know, make music for ourselves just in the parlor whatever just play play in your living room and and let it flow or you can have aspirations to sell you know a million copies of a record that is like do you i i i i find that i admire the people that just have to get it out like, yes do you and find how do they do you relate to that? Do you? Yeah, I because I think how do they how do they do that? Yeah. They make it look so easy, and they can get. Yeah. I I was watching um, a video of Antietam. Are you familiar with the group Antietam? I I feel like I've read their name before, but I'm I'm not familiar with their music. No. Okay, they um they started in, I think it was probably the late '80s, 
um, Tara Key is one of the members. And anyway, so this was a, a video of them playing in um, the Boston area. And, um, and she's just moving around, like, you know, bopping and pl playing her guitar and totally, totally immersed in it. Um, and I was watching and thinking, it would be so cool to do that. And, and how can people, you know, what, what is it, what is it about them that they can just get so lost in playing? And then, and I can't do that. You know, I still have to hold on to reality. Um, and I, 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 yeah, so I admire people who can get lost in their music for sure. Same, 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 especially yeah. when you see it like that. Like, I'll mm -hmm. definitely, I'm gonna make a note to check those guys out. But like, but there is that thing you're like, how, uh, what, 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 what is it to let go like that? Mm -hmm. And like, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. a, but you know, talking with you about it makes me feel much better, <laughs> better about it. <laughs> because may, maybe some people <sighs> admire people who can, um, you know, keep their foot in reality. Oh, I, yeah, there has to be the, the other foot of it, right? The, the other side mm -hmm. of that, like. The guy, like the, oh, man, you guys always show up on time. Like, what is it? You know, like mm -hmm. little things like that, I think, show more in the other end of the performance, uh, the, 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 the spectrum of it, like getting mm -hmm. to the gig on times, making sure you didn't forget your guitar. Like, <laughs> like, right, right. We, uh, Rich and I were watching, um, a replay, the, uh, um, documentary about the replacements. And yeah, to just be able to be so carefree and, and freewheeling to just do whatever, do whatever you felt like doing. And you really didn't care if the audience liked it or not. You, you know, they just do your thing and they could love it. They could reject it, but that's not what's important. What's important is that, you know, they, they were, um, doing whatever they felt like doing and it they didn't feel like they had to be accepted yeah those guys didn't feel it at all <laughs> they like work to not feel it in a very like interested like it's groups like that too kind of also like you when you see that when you see them like doing the the, the pushing the opposite way and like they're getting the opposite effect where people are still involved even though they're being pushed away you know mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. another fascinating like yeah. phenomena yeah and they were drawing people in because they were sort of outcasts themselves so the outcast type people people who felt like oh i don't fit in they became their audience and and actually um they were um what would be the word they they were lifesavers uh, you know, the replacements were lifesavers to some of these people who, um, you know, they, they, it gave them more purpose in life. Um, so, so yeah, so they, it, you know, it helped a lot of young people through some, um, some rough times when they might've been, you know, these people would have been doubting themselves and they had the replacements kind of as a, a really cool uncle or, um, you know, good friend at school it is like the the, the not f feeling that you're the only person that thought or experienced this i think is an incredibly empowering um feeling to know that yeah. someone else is going through it went through it um experienced it i think that's that's mm -hmm. a super powerful feeling feeling right yeah it yeah it feels so good to know that someone else is going through this or has gone through it too. And then you don't feel as alone. Um, so that's why conversation is very good because you never know the person, you know, that you talk to might feel exactly the same way. Right. Or even like the person you, you kind of have a vision of in your head. You're like, Oh, that, uh, that guy, they, they got it together. They're doing all this. It's working out for them. They're super confident in what they're doing and everything they do, they just seem to kill it. And then when you talk with them and it's, they're panicking about everything and it's, not, <laughs> yes. it's, you know, right. it's not that at all. Yeah. And you're like, Oh my God, you're a human too. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Even, um, 
Well, there was uh, Billy Joel performing. I didn't watch all the Grammys, just kind of here and there. Um, but Billy Joel saying that he something about he didn't want to hear his he didn't want to record because he didn't want to hear his voice. Like he just, I, I, you know, he just didn't want to hear his voice. And it took a lot of um, persuading to get him to record again. So here's this singer who sounds, you know, he's got a great voice. He's been singing for, for decades and he doesn't want to hear his voice. He's feeling, he's not feeling confident about it. And um, I, I remember watching a, a documentary about singers um i think it was in particular about rock or or specifically about rock singers and um so one of the people they interviewed was um roger daltrey now it you know when i hear the who i think oh they're all so confident and you know no problem just get up and scream the songs and and he's you know he's kind of when you see them perform, he seems to be kind of full of himself, you know, very confident, um, at least, you know, from the younger days. And um, um, and here during this interview, he when he would listen back to the um, to the tracks, he would cringe. He would think, oh, my voice sounds so awful. Um, and it's all. It's all. How you feel about it how maybe it's just what's in your head like oh i was kind of struggling for that note and that's so you feel it rather than hearing it through someone else's from someone else's perspective um so yeah so people who are even you know that um top performers are um you know they they don't feel um, good about their performances or, or they just aren't comfortable with listening back to their own voices. And that was something that I really related to. It's like, oh, okay, it's not just me. That is that is definitely like, especially at the Billy Joel thing, like that guy's been recorded forever, you know, and like, but, yeah. but it, and, and as you change and like your voice changes, the, you know, I can understand why maybe someone wouldn't feel as confident about, but like, it's it's so kind of like I don't want to say it's refreshing, but it's like so like relatable and like kind of humanizing in a way to like be like yeah. th these gods of rock and roll are mortal. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and like and and also like uh, my girlfriend, she plays in a band. She's like every time that red light comes on. Every time we record, I, I I fuck up things I never thought I would fuck up, and I'm like, yeah, because that red light's on. Like that's just part of the experience of tracking. It's like, right, you know, and like, oh, it's mm -hmm. it's it's so much of like, it, it, I guess part of it is, is like getting getting the best you can out of that moment, and knowing that's the best it can be then, and like listening how you were saying, hearing it through other people's perspectives, and trying to. Um, completely remove your thoughts, expectations, and um, like un like unrealized visions of it out of the way. So, like, mm -hmm. did I guess so? Kind of the dive back, <laughs> the switch it up. So, like, um, when it came to tricycle, you guys demoed it out a lot, demoed yeah. those tunes out a lot, and like. Mm -hmm. Uh, singing in all these different groups and, and, you know, and just getting out of this duo and kind of having more vocal work there. Um, when it came time to take a lead and track, did you find yourself in a similar situation or was it easier to kind of like, um, after, like after doing all the, the demos that is, did you find yourself in a similar situation W with recording your voice on the record for Tricycle or was it easier to kind of get past it and really hear what needed to be done for like a good take of the tune? Uh, I had many moments of struggle during um, in, in the studio. Uh, there's uh, there's pressure in the studio. You know, you see the dollar sign going by and, and you go in thinking, all right, I'll, I need to do it in one take. And you totally forget that the Beatles did 
17 takes, 20 takes. Um, but they were the Beatles. They, you know, they, there was money backing them. So, and, and they had played so much live that they were pretty, they were a well-oiled machine when they went in to do their recordings. Um, so, yeah, so I would go in with the, with the thought of, oh, I've got to get it the first time. And, and I'd get very frustrated if I didn't, um, you're you need to be relaxed you need to relax your voice and that's something that i definitely struggle with because my um i personally hold a lot of tension in my neck and so well there's where the vocal cords are and how do you sing how do you relax everything when you're feeling um uptight or nervous about doing a good performance um so so yeah, it was it was a struggle. Um, some some songs went a little better than others, but there were some parts um, uh, of songs where I you know I just thought I did a like a horrible take and and you know we go back and and do it again. Um, I have to say that I wasn't as uptight with Speed the Plow. I have memories of some Speed the Plow songs where. I did get it in one take and, and, and maybe one take with just a little bit of a fix. Um, um, I think follow your visions was one. And then um, uh, off of Marina. Um, um, once in a while. Okay. Now um, on Marina. All right. So according to what I have here, um, the Speed the Plow albums from back then. Um, so the first album was Speed the Plow. That was with um, uh, Jim Dirigatis on it. Um, I know I got to keep them in order. Um, okay, Wonder Wheel was 1991. And that was um, Stan was a drummer. Um, and then came Mason's Box. That was 93. So at that point, we have the crossover or the coexistence of, of uh, Wild Carnation and Speed the Plow. All right, and that has Follow Your Visions on it. Um, so, and then came Marina, and that was 1995. Uh, a Saint Restored, and then A Hard Friend to Keep. My recollection is that they were, it was one take or maybe a second take. Very, it just, I guess I could just get into the song a little better. Um, so maybe it was a, a, the collaboration of the group. Um, the fact that I didn't have to sing every song, that there were just a few. And and I could just, I, I just kind of had this, um, I, I still have the memory of, you know, recording in the, you know, in the, in the room with the headphones on and seeing people behind the, you know, the console in the, um, the engineering room. And, and that, I guess, gave me a little more inspiration. And I, I, I was able to find the relaxed voice better during those sessions for whatever for whatever reason um so uh yeah i mean i think that yeah. makes sense also like wild carnations kind of was 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 your first you band you know your your band mm -hmm. this is, and so there's also that kind of like uh maybe unlike thought of at the moment or unspoken of like pressure of proving your yourself to to everyone else and not in like not that you were thinking this maybe but it's like one of those like things that uh, unspoken pressure is like this is i'm finally putting out my voice and then then you're like oh crap i'm finally putting out my voice <laughs> like right. yeah yeah <laughs> and i think it's i and not to sound um sexist but i think it's easier for men because you can sing in like it goes anywhere from oh, I'm trying to think of someone with a really 
really well-trained voice, but let's just say, you know, well-trained voice, really on pitch to um, someone, you know, Ramones or the replacements. And not that they're off pitch, but, but they can, they just have more freedom to express themselves and it doesn't have to be perfect. But I think for women, um, we're not allowed as much to just um, sing however we feel. There's a pressure to sound nice or pretty or like more appealing. Um, if that, if I'm explaining it, okay. Because, because yeah, when you step, when you're, when you step up to the mic as a, as a woman, I think there are different expectations than if a man steps up to a microphone, especially let's say a, a woman with a guitar or a man with a guitar. Man with a guitar could be, could be Dylan. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a guitar player with a, with a really good, strong voice. And I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, but just fill in the blank of someone who is very well trained um at their craft the uh, um, yeah just the the opposite the the mm -hmm. uh, t t uh, what's his name ed sheeran to the bob dylan <laughs> right and then um so as a woman you know a woman stepping up to a mic all right is it going to be a joan baez um joni mitchell taylor swift there aren't too many women up there with voices that need a little forgiving and yet they can be really really popular so i think there's just a little added pressure of you know like you you better sound good yeah i i definitely agree with that um but after so getting through these sessions right and then did going from tricycle in the the super bus recording did you guys do the same type of approach did you demo most of super bus before going we, in and track it we we did and that actually leads to a uh, um something that i want to touch on so we recently found a cd of the um of the super bus demos and get, getting back to the tricycle demos like i we have memories of recording that you know where we were and how it went and and like and mixing it and <clears throat> and all that we made uh back then we made cassettes to send to record companies or to send to clubs um in the hopes of getting a, a gig um with Superbus, we demoed most of the songs and and at least rich and i have no recollection of doing it and so we know we used our Tascam reel-to-reel, eight-track reel-to-reel, really nice board, um, but it's, you know, it's old <laughs> at this point. Um, so we use that, and we know we use microphones. We know we set up sound. We did, you know, I, I did vocals, um, but we have no recollection of where we recorded it, how we even mixed it. I mean, I guess we, we would have mixed it on our on the Tascam console, but then we would have to mix it to another, you know, uh, another machine, uh, like a quarter inch tape, um, or maybe even half. I don't, I don't, but I no recollection of what reel to reel it went on. And, um, I think we came across DATS and then a CD and th thank God the CD exists. And we had no recollection of how it went from tape to the CD because this we're talking 1999. Okay, so we didn't have that technology, and and I don't know. We need to do more mental digging to figure out how how we did these demos. Um, but they sound really really good, and I mean, we were listening to them, and I just felt the adrenaline um, surging and you know, like kind of sweaty palms because it's like, wow, 
like how did we do this and and some of the versions um on the demos just have a more energy than the final recording of Superbus, you know, the actual um, final release. Uh, so, so those demos um, are now. So we we in the mean since our last um, time that that Dave, you and I spoke, um, uh, Wildcard Nation is much more active on Bandcamp. So we have a lot more on there than we had uh, a year ago. Um, so the Superbus demos are on there. Um, just put them on yesterday, last night, actually. Um, the tricycle demos are still part of Delmore. Um, so that, that's the free download. Um, I, I believe you can buy the download you know, from Delmore. So that's still a, a Delmore thing. But the Superbus demos are ours. They belong to the band. And so those are now um they're now there and and can be um purchased on Bandcamp. Um so you know thankfully, thankfully we found that and we were just digging through stuff and like, oh here's a seat what you know, what's this? It's a CD that says Superbus demo. It's like, do you remember doing this? And I mean we knew that we demoed, but we just cannot other than um Okay, one of the one of the demos that is on there that we are not able to release yet is uh, a cover of Tomorrow Never Knows. Um, Bandcamp has a policy: if it's not your song, don't put it up there. Um, but I know there's a way to get licensing. We just haven't done that yet. Um, but Rich and I both have a recollection of recording Tomorrow Tomorrow Never Knows. Um, so we we know that we didn't totally imagine it and we don't do drugs so it wasn't like we were to, so you know spaced yeah, out that yeah. we have no we weren't you know totally trashed and have no recollection of of um doing these recordings uh so hopefully tomorrow never knows will be up there um but all the other demos that we did are on Bandcamp now and um yeah yeah and it's it's just it's a bit raw when we did the demos um so the demo is that on, on the cd it says 1999 and um and Anne joined as keep and hopkins joined as keyboardist in 1999 so we did these demos before she joined the band so there are no keyboards other than i played a melodica on um the road to bielefeld because it it needed an organ part like that was that um, actually the road to Bielefeld was a dream song. Rich wrote, woke up with this song with some lyrics and uh, luckily remembered it, um, which included this um, keyboard part. That descending thing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a like a, um, the melodic is a little bit out of pitch. I wish, well, it's, a, it's, it's an instrument you can't tune. So it's just, it's all the reading it what it is. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool though. Like, <laughs> uh, I wish I checked band camp last night at midnight before uh -huh. we talked. <laughs> that would have been, cause I, I was wondering about that. Cause the last, like how you said, tricycle had all the demos on it, but that's, that's super exciting. Mm -hmm. And just to find it too, like the rush of that. The rush of like mm -hmm. oh, we did something and it still holds up and like, yeah you know yeah. that's the but the, nothing feels more uh, as rewarding as like I think I've been doing it right for a while ah <laughs> yeah yeah and that was something that I I wanted to mention too um, like when when you're working on something you get an earworm and, and you just you just can't hear what sounds good or what doesn't sound good just you know too much saturation so. You know, sometimes you really need to leave it for a while and then go back to it. Yes. Um, yes. So it had been decades. I mean, I don't know when we would have listened to this, to the Superbus demos last, but it was probably the year 2000 when we were then preparing to record it at the Pigeon Club in, um, in Hoboken and James Mastro and the band. So James Mastro was a producer. I mean, we were... Um, the band was, we were the producers as well, but, but, um, James was basically at the, at the helm 
Um, so that's probably the last time we would have listened to it. And to listen now and feel like, wow, really happy with this. Um, it shows that, you know, it, it's it's held up um, yeah. over time. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> with um, So... And and last time I know we talked about it, and tricycle comes from the name of the trio, but mm-hmm. there's the kind of the concept uh, concept in my mind I was drawing for like you go from a tricycle to a bus. It's kind mm-hmm. of like growing in your 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 like you know the just the natural progression of how you handle transportation. And we kind of talked about transportation on the last rec uh, about the last record going from one place to the next, but this record Superbus has a lot kind of. In that direction, I feel um, uh, thematically, especially with like Sab story. So, yeah. <laughs> like so. Yeah. Can we? Can you jump into a little bit of the narrative behind that and like where that came from? Yeah. Um, so I don't think there was an intentional traveling. There was. Uh, let's just say there was not a, an intentional traveling um, theme. Yeah in this but it, i guess through the lyrics it just kind of it's just something that you can easily talk about so so yeah wow okay yeah thanks for bringing that up so sob story um is about so i have a definite recollection of driving to work and um you know really bad drivers and and i just started to hear these lyrics in my head you know he he drives his, or she drives her SUV, as, you know, and and so each, um, so I guess when I got to work, I had the time to just write the basic concept down, and and then just kept adding to it. Like in the, ne- the next chapter would be the person who cut me off on the highway, or, um, but then I, um, I, I kept it shorter. I mean, I could have gone on and on with more verses, but just kept it to. Uh, a verse about each type of bad driver, um, you know, the distracted person, the person in the in the car who doesn't believe that they should move to the right, that they they can just stay in the left lane, and you know they're like king of the road. Um, so these various drivers who just make traveling miserable for for people who are trying to obey the law and and you know trying to be a little safer um so and then i believe we had another title for it and then it just kind of came out of the blue like sob s-a-a-b like sob story have you heard the expression sob story okay i I wasn't sure if that was an expression that went out of vogue um so, so in a way, it is a sob story. It's me griping about these different bad drivers. And then there's, oh, yeah, there's, there's the, the car, the sob car, S-A-A-B. With the, like a fun, a fun play on words. Um, nothing against the sob, um, you know, automotive company. They weren't necessarily sob drivers in, in the song. Um, but it was just, yeah, just a little play on words for that one. Um, but yeah, the road to Bielefeld is about an actual trip from Bielefeld to Frankfurt, uh, Germany, uh, when Wild Carnation was touring there in 1997. Um, Catch a Curb is, is actually about skateboarding, um, and a little play on words. Um, there's the Beach Boys Catch a Wave about surfing. So this is about skateboarding. You're going on curbs rather than waves. Um, The Meadowlands is not about travel. Um, That's about the New Jersey Meadowlands and inspired by a book by um, John, I think it was John Sullivan. Um, He wrote this really, really cool book about the history of the Meadowlands in New Jersey and it just has this fascinating history, and I love the way he writes. So that was just inspired by um, by his book. Um, I'd rather drive a truck. Okay, we're back to driving. But that is a quote from, um, so this is actually a tribute to Ricky Nelson. 
singer, songwriter, you know, um, cutie pie of the 1950s, but he wanted to grow up and get out of that stereotype and, and do rock and roll. And he, he was criticized for that. Um, and so he wrote the song Garden Party. Um, and one of the lines in the song is, I'd rather drive a truck. It's like something, something, something. If something, 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 well, I'd rather drive a truck. Um, so this is a tribute to him. Um, but, but here, the title of the song is about driving, you know, about, it has the word truck in it. Um, and in the song, there's, well, he died in a plane crash. So there is talking about, you know, flying in a plane and crashing. Um, but written a little more poetically, uh, poetic, like um, sitting under a tree, um, slingshot round the sun. It's a kind of a wink um, towards Star Trek. It's all it's all Star Trek um, uh, slogans or phrases phrases from Star Trek. You know, Captain, we're lost. Um, thrown from our course, let's fling shot around the sun. It's all, all quotes from Star Trek. Uh, yeah, and that the um, um, the demo of that is is really really good. Um, Slingshot around the sun was one song that I thought maybe we should not have it on this on Superbus, but um, but it stayed on. But that was I would I hate to say it, but that would was like my least favorite song um but it's it's redeemed on the um on the demo yeah so okay it was you know um it it like it's it's bare bones were it it was good it was a good rock song um cricket is is about a like a, a summer evening even so the rest of it is not so much about traveling um but but yeah it definitely starts out with a lot of with that a lot of travel related so the super bus you know it, kind of a metaphor or sort of hidden meaning so yes you start on a tricycle and then later on um a bus um another meaning behind it or a little more buried um is that you know a tricycle has three wheels and wild carnation was a trio okay um when superbus was recorded we were a quartet we were foursome so a bus has four wheels well theoretically i mean i guess they yeah. have more like eight wheels but um but a, a theoretically a four-wheeled vehicle rather than three wheel and yes it does go a little bit faster um, but if you look at the artwork, it's all flowery type stuff. And the super bus is the name of a type of carnation. So those little really, really subliminal buried. Um, and actually the, all right, this, so this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to plug this, but um, I'm sorry, the, the demos were available on Bandcamp maybe a week ago. What just went, live yesterday is um the super bus cds um we produced these cd cds it was basically the band um we're our own record label um so these were um the cds it, the cd was i'm sorry the super bus recording was made in 2000 and then we just let it sit um rich and i had a son um and at that point we couldn't find a record company to pick up on the recording um and i guess we were just kind of fed up maybe or just disillusioned with with um putting out records or you know what like where do we where do we go with this like where where are we going to turn to um so in 2006 we started playing again and decided all right let's just put it out ourselves we'll just we'll just pay for it. Um, so we had them manufactured and, um, so CD only, um, and many of them have been sitting in boxes over the years. We've sold 
here and there at Feely shows, but, um, you know, not a lot. And so this seemed to be the time to just, all right, why don't we just, we have this band camp set up. Why don't we just sell these CDs and, and just see what happens. But anyway, so the artwork on the CD, which was produced in 2006, has um, a reference to the Superbus Carnation. Um, so, any, so if anyone buys the CD, you'll see um, actually coming from a dictionary, Dianthus, Pink's Carnation, Carnation, Spring and Summer Blooming Perennials, and the cultivar is Superbus. So it is a type of carnation. And so I know I'm, I'm kind of going on a long no, time. No, no, I love it. Original, I'm like, that's amazing. That's okay, what I was saying original, to myself. <laughs> okay. The original artwork on the CD is just sort of a generic carnation, which always bothered Rich and me because we, we love to garden. And, and the name Wild Carnation came from going out and looking at the garden, like right outside the house, and there were these wild carnation growing, wild carnations growing, and um, there was just like, oh, band name. Um, let's write it down. Um, so what you see on the CD packaging is just a generic carnation. Um, what is on the vinyl, which was released in 2023, is the actual super bus and also on our band camp site um or band camp page at the the banner at the top is a photograph of an actual super bus so in, in recent years rich and i started growing super buses in our backyard found the seeds and started um growing them so that's a photo of one of the super buses in our yard um so now now that like that's all um accurate that's uh, that's incredible uh, i yeah. would never have put that that together that that's it's, it's, that's so yeah. awesome that's it's so really awesome. subliminal it's really subliminal and but we you know we have fun with it and um and again on the cd if anyone really looked at the artwork they would see the um description of what a super bus is that's so um cool. That's so cool. I when you, when you get it as when you got a, a concept as a group, uh, you know you can dive into it that much without the concept mm -hmm. kind of diluting the music that comes out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's such a yeah. that's such it a cool, impactful thing. It, like, yeah, it's serendipity a lot of it. But actually, um, the um, so these recordings, which became Superbus, um, were originally called Pong. Like that was going to be the name of the album. P O N G exclamation point. Um, so the whole super bus thing came in later on, like the the flower, the fact that it's a you know step up from a tricycle. Um, all of that that just came at a later time, but originally would have I don't know why we chose pong, but just it was just kind of a funny word, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, after after that whole explanation, the super bus, the, it, it doesn't seem like it couldn't have been anything else. Like that's yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's too on the point. Like, mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd relate to that as a group when you have an idea and like, so I don't know why we would call it that, but if you check this out, if it goes with this and that and that and lines up and like everyone mm -hmm. gets that like excitement ping, like what? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, like, there and yeah. there's there's an energy to that, you know. So yeah, mm -hmm. super bus, it couldn't have been anything but. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's and amazing. and Rich's old matchbox car and bus are yeah. on the cover. So and but they're amidst they're on on rocks, but there are flowers all around. So that was the they just placed the cars in the garden and took a photograph. Um so you know there there you have the super bus and the super bus <laughs> kind of coming together. Super bus exception. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Mm. Um, and that's just so cool. You found those demos too. I can't. When, when we're done talking, mm -hmm. I'm gonna check them out. Um, so you mentioned that you, you there's some new songs in the works. When we were talking about dream songs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we 
Yeah, some of those are demoed. Um, some of them we started to record and just never finished it. Um, so it's all it's been on the back burner for a really long time. When we would play live, um, we would do probably as many new songs as old songs. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard to say exactly when or how. Um, you know, we we do have basic tracks, and yeah, so it's it's um it's not let's just say it's not done <laughs> but but we could um we could release a few songs at a time you know realistically just to do more of an ep size or ep length and and then do it in in p in groupings yeah um well in like i don't know it it I, I like the I prefer the album kind of chunk when you get the whole album, but like with how streaming stuff is now, that's what people that's how it seems to be working. Is people put out singles and then put out an EP and like it's slowly kind of dwindled to you as opposed to as opposed to like here's a record, you know, in one yeah. chunk. Um but that's cool. And mm -hmm. like uh so do you think that's a is that something you guys are going to pursue you think or is it just kind of uh, yeah. an idea? Yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely. We just we just don't know when. That's that's the problem. Is the you know life moves on and um, yeah, it's hard to um, carve out enough time to do a whole album. Um, so yeah, um, but you know, getting back to Speed the Plow, um, John and Tony have worked on music. Um, throughout the years and and also during the pandemic and they were doing they were releasing a song a month and just inviting other people to join them so rich and i joined on a um a couple songs um so you can certainly do releases a little bit at a time especially with something like Bandcamp, um where you know people will be notified if something new like well followers if you follow a band you'll be notified whenever something new. So whether it's, you know, a, a song a month or a grouping of songs, you know, it's, it's okay to do it in, in whatever way works for you. And the, in the, was it the feelies just putting out a record as well? Yeah. Yeah. For, from so, in between when we mm -hmm. talked that, um, the velvet underground cover record, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that came out really, really well. Um, I, I get the same adrenaline rush and sweaty palms when I when I listen to that, and especially the first time I listened to um, the the mix. Um, and it, it's I almost um, because that was such a um, I don't know for for I guess for the whole band, but I could. I could just speak for myself like that, that performance. Um, uh, and that was, I think that was October 13th of 2018. Um, you know, that is, um, it's, it's really a, 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 I was, I was petrified um, because it, you know, it's not easy doing somebody else's music. And especially that much. I mean, I think it's like eighteen tracks, and just you know the preparation for that, and and what we were talking about earlier, like you want to do it justice, you want to do a good job because it's it's somebody else's songs. Um, so I guess I there was yeah there was, I would say a little more pressure to play well that evening and have everything go well and sound well. Um, and it was, you know, we knew it was being recorded and, and that can be a little, you know, that can add to the stress of, um, you know, wanting to do a, a good job because it's there, you know, it'll be there on, on the track if you, if you botch something up. Um, so I guess when I listened to it and what I didn't realize was that I was listening to the final mix when I, um, when I was listening to the copy that was 
either sent to me or given to me. I thought it was to just weigh in on, you know, how it is. And, and then I was like, um, and I had a few, just a few little suggestions. Like if it's not too late, you know, maybe blah, blah, blah. And, and it turned out, well, no, this is the final mix. So, so then I was listening, you know, more, you know, sweaty, like, um, um, just waiting to hear mistakes or, you know, something that's going to jump out. So unfortunately, when, when you make a recording or you're part of a recording, you're not listening like other people would listen. They're just, they're just listening to the music. And yeah, if, if there was a big mistake, a certain number of people would notice it, but many people won't. Um, so, so when you're listening to your, own stuff which is kind of you know it's precious to you but you're not listening in the relaxed way of a um uh an outside listener you're you're just listening for mistakes basically you're looking for the things that are wrong rather than the things that are right and and that takes away from um your satisfaction um but but this so listening back to this, um, I was doing a lot of whew, you know that okay that okay that's good that's good, um, but um, yeah yeah there's a, a lot of energy in that recording, and um, and Scott Anthony did a great mastering job, and um, what I was told was that he so as far as mixing for the album. Um, he started with the vocal mics and then built up the instruments from there because in the vocal, in the vocal mics, there's a lot of um, instrument bleeding into it, you know, drums, amps. And so you, I don't know how much of the direct lines from the instruments he brought up, but apparently there was quite a bit of, um, you know, the instruments already there in the vocal mics. And, and I thought that was brilliant to not like, because generally when you do a mix in a studio, you know, you start with the drums and then you, and, and even a live, actually a, a live gig, when you're doing the sound for the room, you start with the drums, you add the bass, you add the guitar, um, you have vocals, um, monitor vocals, make sure your, your monitors are loud enough. And then the vocals are brought up in the house. And, and this was going the opposite way. You start with the vocals and then you bring the instruments up wherever needed to balance it out. Um, so it just has this really cool quality about it um, that, that I love. I think you did a great job on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he and um, Bill worked with him uh, over i'm not sure how many um days bill was there but um for for part of it bill was there and then the rest was scott um you know mastering um so yeah so um as far as the albums that came out and this was this was totally unintentional it's just again serendipity um tricycle came out on vinyl for the first time um, in April of 2023, um, it was on white vinyl and it sold out. So then a second pressing was made with green vinyl. And as far as I know, they're still, they're still available. And that included, um, um, digital download plus bonus tracks. And then October 13th, um, Feely's vinyl came out, the, um, some kind of love velvet underground tribute, um, and then Wild Carnation Superbus, actually, I think that was October 9th, so I, I went a little bit out of order. So Superbus came out on vinyl through Pine Hill Records. Um, I believe they've all sold out by now, um, but there are still copies out there, like at record stores or um, oh, probably um, online. There's a, oh, I forget the name of it. Um, discogs where you can go and see if if there's anything you know you could any copies of something that you could buy um online um 
So, yeah, so three, I mean, after, what, a decade um, of no releases, um, uh, trying to think when, um, in between, the feelings in between came out, well, okay, not quite, not quite a decade, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but let's just say after a really long time, no releases um for me personally there were three vinyl releases in one year so 2023 was was a busy year um, yeah yeah just yeah it music became um yeah the music side of life became very busy again and there were a lot of interviews you know including yours um for tricycle and now we're just getting around to a few um interviews for super bus well i'm i'm super honored that you reached out to do another one this is awesome oh well and thank you for um saying yes of course <laughs> i when you're ready to do the the next record <laughs> please oh. hit me back up i would love to dive into that okay sure and so in the meantime um yeah whatever we have available and, and we do need to go through the archives because um you know there there are songs that were recorded um that we could you know just get onto the the band camp site um i do want to point out one song um one song that's on the Superbus demos um it's called blue skies and it's not the irving berlin blue skies um very opposite of of that um, so it was initially earmarked to be on Tricycle, um, but it was a song. So most of the songs for Tricycle were written a few years before um, we actually recorded it. So while Carnation started rehearsing in April of 92, and then we started recording, we got a, um, an offer from Delmore um to record so we recorded in 94 and then it was released in in 95 so i guess towards the end of 94 we had a new song called blue skies um and there was talk about including it on tricycle we ultimately decided no it's going to hold up the whole production so let's put it on the next record so then superbus comes around um we're recording it in 2000 so this is five years later and for whatever reasons it doesn't get on that album either um so i was really really happy when rich and i found um the cd of the Superbus demos and blue skies is on there um and i don't think there's i think what we have on the demo should be the final take i i don't know if we would get it any I don't know that we'd have that same energy that we had when we did the, the demo. So we, we did re-record Blue Skies um, when we were preparing for this next album, which who knows when it's going to come out. Um, but the it just doesn't capture what's on the demo. So I, I think, so finally Blue Skies has its release and I, I think it's all good to just um keep it that way yeah yeah it, mm -hmm. it, it is weird with um certain demos when when they're fresh like with songs when they're fresh and you got like the that excitement for it not yeah. that not that like the more like thought out like um the recording down the line isn't like better or or is good like but there there is something to like when the song is super exciting for everyone at the moment brand new and like there there mm -hmm. that energy is like uh, the, the I, I don't think it's re, you can't recreate that <laughs> like right so yeah that's cool that's exciting god that's yeah yeah so uh so yeah the, this could be you know wild carnation the lost tracks um, but Blue Skies is definitely one of them. And um, yeah, and hopefully we can get Tomorrow Never Knows onto Bandcamp because um, that, that is a really, that was a really fun um, uh, recording process for that. 
and I, I think people would enjoy our version of it. Yeah, I mean, maybe people just put them out there in spite of that, but it does, I, I did do a little um, deeper dive into the, the band camp rules and regulations like any website you know you can you can it's a it's a um a rabbit hole trying to you know just reading things and all the rules and everything but um yeah i, I did a search and it's it's very clear they have an explanation and then they say basically if it's not yours don't do it um so it's pretty plain right right there without the the legal jargon um but i know you know like like the feelies have had beetle covers on um a few albums. you know the, the the feelies have released albums with covers and you just have to get the proper licensing and so that when when you sell um you know when you sell that recording or that track that you know whatever whatever the um portion is you know that, that goes to the the songwriter you know um but you know with a lot of people being deceased um uh, there's just a little more tracking down of where you know yeah who holds the license for that particular track um so we got the the Superbus demos that you can get on Bandcamp, as well as the Superbus CDs, which you can also get on Bandcamp now. Um, right. Do you guys have anything else in the works? Is there any Feely gigs? Is there any Wild Carnation gigs or uh, other projects to kind of plug before we wrap it up today? Yeah. Um, Feelies are playing in March and April. Um, it's all on the East Coast. So uh, okay. if, if you go to the Feelies Facebook page, um, you'll see the dates listed there. So, um, so March and April, it's it's D.C., Washington D.C., up through um, New York State at Woodstock. Um, okay. Our nation, we were hoping to have a show in March, which didn't get off the ground. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to find um, gigs here and there, but it's it's not easy right now. Um, but we're trying um, as much as we can right now. Um, so, so the best um, best way. Well, uh, and actually, um, Rich and I have done a number of postings on the Wild Carnation Facebook page, like playing just live, um, generally two guitars, one or two voices. Um, so, if anyone wants to check out those videos. Um, they're pretty pretty lo-fi, but you know they're they're good enough. Yeah, well, they're, um, they're lives, you know. That's... Yeah, yeah, it's live. Um, so just go to the Wild Carnation Facebook page, um, the one that has the the super bus on it. There are apparently two pages. One is I think more of a business type huh. page, but um, but just look <clears throat> for the one with the two um, little Matchbox cars. Um, it's it's pretty it's a pretty colorful little button um and all of the all the um videos that we've you know the the lo-fi um videos that we've done are on there um so the best place to check out what we're doing because we do post on facebook whenever something is coming up or something happens and also Bandcamp. If you follow us on Bandcamp, you would know um, whenever we have a release, and and certainly you would see the, you know, what's already um, been posted on there. And and you can contact the band through either Facebook or um, Bandcamp. Um, we we do have, we're still on. Um, SoundCloud, but uh, that's not the most active place where we are right now. So the most active place will continue to be Bandcamp and Facebook. Gotcha. Yes, SoundCloud. SoundCloud's kind of hard to navigate. It's kind of like a, it's not as clear mm -hmm. as Bandcamp. 
Oh, yeah. One thing I wanted to ask I, before. Sorry, sorry, Nan. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, if, if you do a search, um, Wild Carnation Band, because you'll often get flowers. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's on flowers, so Wild Carnation Band. Um, one thing I wanted to ask uh, before before wrapping it up was, uh, did you guys, uh, the Feelys had the, the Hanukkah gig. Yes. How was that? It was, um, it was, um, I'll remember it forever. It was, yeah. I thought it was awesome. Um, it was just so cool to be opening for Yola Tango and, um, Stan and Dave, you know, drummer and percussionist, um, played basically throughout the whole Yola Tango set after the Feelies opened. Um, the Feelies for, for various reasons, we did an acoustic set. Okay. Um, so rather than a full blown feely set, we decided we were kind of looking for something new to do just to, I don't know, just an, a, a fresh approach to our, our songs and um, decided to do it acoustically. So Stan had this um, really neat little drum kit and it was just a small bass drum, a snare and a couple other things. Um, Dave had his usual percussion um bill and glenn played acoustic guitars um i still had i played through a bass but i now have a, a um a, a bass ukulele oh those so, are cool like with yeah the big... this is mm, so this is something we're going to continue to do like the upcoming shows we'll have a set of like sitting down acoustic um and then the full-blown you know um typical <laughs> rock show second second set that's cool um so that that's so that's giving us um more inspiration um so that was really it was a great great audience um the people in yola tango are so nice so good to work with um it was just it was just a lot of fun um my personal story was that i came down with something that was going around and um, it went to full-blown laryngitis the day that I was heading out um, for the Feelys rehearsal. So the day before the Yola Tango show, um, I arrived at re rehearsal and I, I couldn't get anything out. Um, so it was great that Bill handled the backing vocals. Um, when we went to do the show the next day, my voice was still, you know, it checked out and it was, I didn't have a voice for a couple of weeks, you know, whatever this thing was that was going around, people were getting really bad laryngitis. Um, so I wasn't able to sing that evening. Um, and I was supposed to sing um, Dylan's You Ain't Going Nowhere. So at the last minute, um, Yellow Tango decided that they would each take a verse and also Dave Weckerman sang a verse. So they decided to keep the song in the, in the, um, encore portion and um so i went to leave the stage because they they had singers and you know that was all going to be fine and then ira said well where are you going and i said well i i choked out like well, i can't sing and he handed me his guitar and i i was just like that it was worth losing my voice to be able to play Ira's guitar and just be part of that song, not necessarily singing, but being the rhythm guitar. Um, so Ira sang, um, you know, now without guitar and, um, and it, um, people did video it. So it is out there um, on YouTube. And it, it was just, it, for me personally, that was um, one of the evenings I'll never forget. That's so cool. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> so it, it was good. it was it was a really fun show. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Brenda, yeah. thank you so much for chat with me. I dearly appreciate your time, and I super appreciate you reaching out. This was a this made my day. I've been I've been trying to get over this whole bug myself, um, mm -hmm. different bug I hope, but um, yeah. this is this has been very enjoyable. So thank you. And and likewise, thank you so much, Dave. And um, it's been a pleasure.
Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy.